right, I'm going to talk about five pests today. We'll start off with the Asian longhorn beetle. This beetle came to us from Asia and was first found in Brooklyn, New York. The bottom picture was taken at an infestation site in Ohio. And I put this picture in here to demonstrate how conspicuous and large these beetles are. We could look up in the infested trees and see the beetles walking all over the branches. So how did this pest get here? Like other pests that we know and love, it arrived in wooden pallets and crates, usually in the form of a pupa, and emerges as an adult once it arrives here in the States. One interesting note about this pest is it is also a major pest in its native range of China, which is an anomaly of invasive species. It's a rather dangerous pest because it has lots of hosts, including many maples, elms, and a skeletal species, just to mention a few, and other popular um, nursery trees. Eradication programs that are continuing. The first one was in New York. The last beetle sighted there was in 2010. So they are in their second year of declaring their state beetle free. If they haven't declared it yet, it'll take several more years. And so far they have had to remove over 18,000 trees. In Chicago, Illinois, it was found in 1998. And with community involvement and support from the mayor, they were able to eradicate this pest with only 1,500 trees removed. It was found in New Jersey in October of 2002, last seen there in 2006. So I believe that one county there has been declared ALB free, and they're working on a couple of other counties. And they have had to remove almost 22,000 trees. Massachusetts in 2008 it was found, and these um, infest infested trees are still being found. And so far they have removed over 30,000 trees. And bad news for us, there's me looking rather dismayed to find the beetle. It was found in Bethel, Ohio, which is only about five to 10 miles away from Kentucky. The regulated area there was initially 56 square miles and was expanded to 61 square miles on August the 23rd of this year. The movement of infested firewood was cited as the cause of the second infested site. So what they're doing in Ohio right now, the USDA and other members of the public are looking for infested trees. So far they have surveyed 170,575 trees. They speculate that ground surveyors using binoculars are about 30 to 40 percent efficient at finding an infested tree, and tree climbers are about 70 percent efficient in finding an infested tree. Once an area has been found to be infested, they'll resurvey that area for one time a year to three or five years before they can declare that site beetle free. So far in Ohio, they have re removed 8,716 trees. Claremont County is the county in Ohio where it is. Um, this is a wood pile that we visited last summer. It was very near the first infested tree found there. And here are some, well first I'll tell you, the USDA will come, down, come in and cut down the tree at no cost to the homeowner. Some things we were finding on this pile of wood. There were adult beetles climbing all over the wood on the top right. We found logs with larval tunnels in them. You can see those on the left, and you can see why this beetle is so damaging to the tree. And the exit holes of the adult on the bottom right. Tuesday, there was a news release, which is exciting for the residents of Claremont, Kentucky, I mean Claremont, Ohio. Um, they're going to up the funding, which will actually help in replanting efforts. Um, the ODNR recognizes the loss of trees and how 
traumatic that can be and how it changes the canopy. So now they are putting funding towards replanting, which eases homeowners when you tell them you're going to have to lose a tree. So what to look for? The um, female beetle will chew these oval to round pits in the bark to lay her eggs in. It takes her over 45 minutes to chew these, which I think is rather remarkable. Exit holes is another symptom to look for. Large, as you can see. Sawdust-like material called frass, which is insect waste mixed with plant material. We didn't really see any of this symptom on the trees we were looking at. You may also see um, oozing sap. Again, we didn't really see this symptom where we were, but it's possible. The two trees on the top, it was take, this picture was taken across the street from that wood pile I showed earlier. The tree in the foreground is a silver maple. The tree in the background is a red maple. This, the picture isn't great, but the silver maple in front is, has major dieback. It was covered in exit holes, and the tree in the background, the red maple, had no exit holes as far as we could tell. This is pretty good news for us because that means the Asian longhorn beetle is pretty lazy. Once it finds a good spot, it tends to stay there. Um, red maple has been shown to be a host, so this is why eradic eradication efforts are so successful. And another note, um, this homeowner didn't really notice anything was wrong with his trees until surveys were done. So surveys are a very important part of eliminating the beetle. The beetle is large, black and white, with banded antenna, and their feet may appear blue. It can be confused with a couple of other pests, the cottonwood borer and the pine, saw pine sawyer, which are both native. If you take a good look at the Asian longhorn beetle, you can tell that it's rather distinct. That wraps up my first pest, and I'll take any questions. I have a question. Yes. Uh, when the tree is removed, does the USDA, do they burn the wood, or? He's asking what happens with the removed tree. The removed tree is chipped and mulched to a size where the larva would no longer be able to survive. Okay. Yes. I heard, uh, was any of this found in northern Kentucky yet, recently? It has not been found in Kentucky yet, but it's really close. <laughs> yes? So they're not using basically chemical means to eradicate those mechanical means like chipping? Correct. So far, only mechanical means have been used. Um, it seems to be, this is one of the few pests that um, eradication efforts have been successful, so they're kind of continuing on that where they can just take out the whole tree and it works, so they're sticking with that. No chemicals right now. Anyone else? Um, yes? I know firewood, you're not supposed to use hand support. Um, bag mulch products from Ohio, okay, or not so much? She's asking about moving mulch products from Ohio. I would say as long as it's less than a half of an inch, it would be fine. Um, but so far, there's no regulations on that. Size. Size, yes. Are you ready to learn about thousand canker disease? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just one, yes. All right, this disease complex is native to the western United States and primarily affects black walnuts, which is very sad. I love black walnuts. So I gave you a recipe for black walnut cake on the back of your sheet. Um, this is actually the combined activity of a walnut twig beetle and a fungus, Geosmithia morbida. The first player in this interaction is the walnut twig beetle. It's less than two millimeters long. It's basically the size of a letter on a penny, and it carries with it this fungus, Geosmithia. The fungus causes cankers that are circular to oblong in the phloem. 
these coalesce and eventually destroy the cambium, eventually killing the tree. These cankers are rather small at first, and they're found around the beetle galleries or beetle exit holes. The major symptoms to look for, um, branch mortality. Upon closer investigation, you'll see numerous small cankers on the branches in the bulb. And finally, evidence of tiny bark beetles, whether it be the beetle itself, exit holes, or galleries. In the early stages of the disease, the tree will show flagging. In the later stages, there will be rapid foliage wilting. Here are some more symptoms of the beetle. On the left are the galleries. Top right and bottom left are cankers. And on the bottom right is a tiny, tiny exit hole. We spent one whole afternoon last summer at a workshop trying to um, recognize this disease. We had known infested logs and we were looking for cankers. It's very hard to find. It's right under the phloem and it's really easy to go too deep. We spent all afternoon and we're not able to find them. So it's really hard to detect in the field. One reason this beetle is so damaging is it's very prolific. This research was done at Colorado State. They took these two infested logs into the lab, bagged them up, and watched what came out of them. Over 23,000 beetles came out of these two logs, meaning that there were 35 beetles per square inch. These beetles are also hyperactive, meaning they, they enter and exit the wood multiple times, each time inoculating with the disease, the fungus. This map is a little confusing, but I'll work my way through it. In the west, in the pink states, is where the disease is native. On the east coast, the purple or gingham states, Tennessee, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, have inter internal quarantines in place for the disease, meaning they have found it in the state. The states with the diagonal stripes have external quarantines, meaning they do not accept regulated material from those states that have found the disease, either in the west or the east. The green markings is the native rage for black walnut. The internal quarantine in Tennessee, these blue counties are the quarantine area, the orange counties surrounding it are a buffer area. The orange counties, the buffer area borders Kentucky. I think this is Bell County right above there. We have some traps there this year. Here are the counties in Virginia that have identified the disease. And one in Pennsylvania. We have a new trap for 2012. This trap was highly effective in Tennessee and Western Trials last summer. There are over 30 traps in Kentucky. We have them in Louisville, Lexington, Bardstown, Bowling Green, and Middlesboro. We focused on street trees and campgrounds because so far this disease seems to target urban plantings, not necessarily a wooded area. And we tried our hardest to check them every 15 days. So far we have zero beetle, jet, beetle um, catches. And even if the beetle is found, you still have to identify that the tree has the disease to declare it a thousand canker disease site. And as usual, I'm going faster than I think, and that one's done. Any questions? Has <laughs> this changed the lumber industry? I mean, is, is the log still used as lumber? Say it again. Is the log still being used as lumber? I believe that the, uh, the logs still can be used as, as lumber as long as they're quartered, debarked and quartered. Um, although I'm not sure. It is my office that does that, though. Um, <laughs> so um, my office number and email is on that sheet that I gave you. We don't have any quarantines in place right now for Kentucky, but we are working on that this fall. Is this one not lazy? This beetle is not lazy. No, that was his question. This beetle flies rather well, and it seems to be prolific. Does it typically, you know, similar to like the tree can at the top part, the uppermost part of the tree can be, or is there a particular part that you see in the 
he asked if there's a place where the beetle usually enters first, like top versus bottom, and I haven't seen any research that indicates that they prefer one area over another. Is there still no treatment? There's currently no treatment for this, no. And it's, it's to my understanding that it's because it's a, a nut crop is one reason why it's so hard to use chemicals to treat. Just a couple things. You mentioned Go ahead. Like last, uh, with the last test that got that moved in the wood, and that's been a real problem because there's so many people that work with black walnut, and they're driving it all around the country, and they're trying to keep it from being in the commerce so much because they're moving this, this particular uh, organism around. And the other thing is you've seen bark beetles, and they are small, but this thing is tiny. I've seen a whole vial of these things, and it's like dust. Mm -hmm. So the chance of seeing these things, you know, you'll see bark beetles, but they're twice or three times the size. Even the small ones in this thing is just, it's just minute. It's just really the shape. So if you have the bark beetles without the fungus, is the tree able to easily recover from that since there's no canker then? It's just a small entry and exit? When, if you have the beetle, you'll have the fungus. Okay. They, they almost always do. Yeah. Okay. This is, this is a, in essence, is an imported pest. We're importing it from the Western United States, where it's where it's native. Okay. Any suggestions on on any form of prevention? Any suggestions on prevention? I don't have any. Um, I would just say, no, I don't have any. Paul, you might. Uh, there's work been done, especially in Colorado and all, but I'm not familiar with it, like using cloak or something like that as a injection. I'm sure they've done that work. I, yeah, I'd imagine even if you caught the beetle at an early stage of infestation and has already inoculated the tree, and it's sort of bad news. What would be the host species in the western of the United States? The Arizona. Yeah. Where, the, where it's native, what would be the most species? It's an Arizona walnut in the west. And there's also plantings of black walnut out west. Anyone else? Are you excited about the next one? There we go. We have some rallying. OK, hemlock woolly adelgid. Another tiny, tiny pest. The woolly adelgid is a sucking insect similar to an aphid. The two insects on the left there are shown next to a hemlock needle just to show how tiny these things are. On the bottom right, those are egg masses that you see, the woolly white egg masses. This pest causes reduced shoot growth, premature needle drop, and eventual tree death. In the north, it takes about four to 10 years to kill off a tree. In the south, it's a shorter time, three to six, just because of our warmer temperatures. They can be active for longer. It affects eastern and Carolina hemlocks. So far, it has killed 90% of hemlocks in the Shenandoah Valley and has been found all over the Great Smoky Mountains. Here's a picture of the Appalachian Trail. I believe this is in Virginia. And this just shows how um, drastic the landscape can change with the loss of our hemlocks. This pest is from Asia. It was found in 1924 on the west coast, and in 1951 was found on the east coast near Richmond, Virginia. See some die back there in the woods. Today it ranges from Maine down to Georgia. Kentucky is as far west as it has been found in the eastern half of the um, country anyway. And it now lives in 18 states. The brown area are infested counties, and the green area are the native range of hemlock. You can see it's down there in Kentucky in the east, southeastern part. Six states now have HWA quarantines. 
Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, Vermont, Maine, and New Hampshire. Some notes about hemlocks in Kentucky. We have at least 6.6 .6 million hemlocks in the state, 98% of which are in the eastern one-third of the state. There are two pockets elsewhere, one in Elizabethtown and one near Mammoth Cave State National Park. The loss of hemlocks, um, we can't begin to describe how drastic the shift in forest species composition would be. Um, it greatly would affect stream wildlife, including invertebrates, and are of special concern to trout fishermen. Trout enjoy cooler temperatures, and with the loss of hemlocks, our streams will not stay as cool. They're a vital part of keeping stream life healthy. They're also a popular landscape tree in yards, which isn't our main problem because it's an easily treated insect um, as long as it's a singular plant. And you can easily treat one tree in your, at your house. Some other areas in Kentucky with HWA, um, Pine Mountain State Park, Lily Cornette Woods, in Cumberland Gap, just to name a few. There are rather effective treatments for this insect. Um, they can contain imidacloprid. They can be effective up to five years. Um, the application method methods preferred are a soil drench or soil injection. Trunk injections don't work for this. Um, it sort of just gums up at the injection site and isn't taken up by the tree. In many studies, um, the hemlocks recovered dramatically with new growth after an imidacloprid application. Trees that had little new growth but no dieback came back fastest. And even those trees that looked pretty poor recovered impressively but slowly. This is the same tree here. Um, on the left, it has a lot of needle loss and dieback and on the bottom right has rebounded rather nicely after an imidacloprid treatment. There is an HWA biological control program in place. It is a Laricobius nigrinus beetle, or as we like to call them, Larry beetles. It's a lot easier to say. Um, Larry Beetle Collection in Kentucky started in 2008 in Seattle, Washington. This is an expensive venture, but an effective one. Since 2008, we have released approximately 1,000 beetles per year at Pine Mountain State Park and one release at Natural Bridge State Park. Here are some of our colleagues collecting beetles. We use upside down umbrellas and shake the tree and they fall out so we can monitor if they are there or not or to collect them. There has been some success with this biocontrol program down in Banner Elk, North Carolina, which is part of the Cherokee National Forest. These beetles have been shown to be overwintering. The releases started there in 2004. We know now that the beetles are reproducing and hemlocks are showing regrowth. On some trees that we have studied, there are 90% predation rates. And now we can go to North Carolina to collect for release in Kentucky instead of Seattle, or in conjunction with Seattle. We have released beetles from North Carolina in Letcher County and Pine Mountain and we found these beetles at Pine Mountain in March, which means they overwintered from last summer, and that's very exciting news. They're establishing themselves in the area and hopefully going to keep this pest in check. Additional resources are listed here, and I'll take questions if you have them. Yes? Um, when you do the and how often, you know, and the, um, the white stuff disappears, do you need to keep doing it every year, or do you wait till if you see it come back? Um, the treatments have been shown to last and be effective for about three to five years. So I would recommend treating on the lower end of that, maybe every three years. Is, is horticultural or this? He 
guess if horticultural oils or dormant oils would work with this, and I haven't read any research on that, but I would venture to guess that it would work on some of the crawler stages. And on applying the soil temperature, is it around the drip line of the tree? I mean, how much of that area be? He's asking how to apply the soil drench. I cannot answer that question with certainty. I've only done um, trunk injects, I mean, uh, soil injections. I haven't done the soil drenches. And with the soil injections, we were just about a foot from the base of the tree, all around it. Um, those areas you showed where all the plants were dead, are seedlings coming up? He's asking if seedlings are coming up in the areas where the hemlocks are dying off. And again, I don't know that answer. I would say if the seedlings are coming up, they'll be hit right away with the, with the adelgid. Anyone else? Yes, go ahead. Uh, did you mention whether the Larry beetle is native to this country or not? The Larry beetle is not native to this country. It's native to Asia where the hemlock woolly adelgid is native to. And biological control programs, I always get questions on them. Um, they are much better screened now than they have been in the past. And it's true, we don't know all the answers as to what the Larry beetle is going to do in this environment. But they are much more strenuously tested and screened for possible um, ramifications of introducing a new insect. Any other holes other than the hemlocks? No other hosts that we know of, no. Um, and what time of the year should it be treated? I would treat in early spring when the tree is uptaking a lot of moisture. And that's when you'll see um, those white masses are most visible from spring to fall. Next one? Okay. This is the European elm flu evil. A cute little guy, I think. We discovered this weevil through part of a national elm trial at the University of Kentucky. We were one of 15 locations participating in this study. There were 20 cultivars planted at this site, which is right across the street from the Arboretum. They were evaluated for pest resistance and horticultural characteristics of landscape suitable elms. And there was some, also some pathology work done there. So my part of the study, we went out and surveyed these trees in the summer just to see what kind of insects we would find on them. Among many other pests, we found three leaf miners, a sawfly, an agonized fly, and a new state record for Kentucky, the European elm flea weevil shown on the left. This is a tiny little guy. I think he looks like Gonzo. <laughs> Easy to spot. And his back legs look like a flea. He has those really enlarged back legs, hence the name European elm flea weevil. This weevil can cause two types of damage across two different life stages. As a larva, um, the egg is laid in the midrib of the leaf, the larva will mine its way to the end of the leaf and then create this blotch mine. These mines can be mistaken for frost damage, like a late frost, April frost maybe. As an adult, it causes shot hole damage by chewing on the leaf. And this damage can be rather extensive. If you think you might have this pest, here are some things to look for. Like I said, the egg is usually laid in the midrib of the leaf. The mine will originate there and end at the border of the leaf in a blotch mine. If you break that mine open, you'll find a larva or a pupa or the adult itself. We found that the adult liked to hang out there for a few days before it emerged from its home. And again, this is another small one, so easy to miss. 
bad news for this one is it attacks elms pretty much across the board, including those with Asian parentage, which historically have been disease and pest free. Even the tiniest of Asian elms can be attacked by this um, flea weevil, as you see here. And I forgot a slide, so I'm just going to read it to you. Um, the best ones, well, we'll start with the worst. Hybrid elms performed the worst, just for this pest. Americans were somewhere in the middle, and those with Asian parentage still fared pretty well against this beetle. If you're looking to plant a Asian parentage, a parvifolia, you need to plant an Emer 2 Ali cultivar, seemed to be the best. And um, almost Americana New Harmony performed the best against this pest. And again, this isn't telling you anything about Japanese beetle damage or horticultural characteristic, just the European elm flea weevil damage. States reporting this beetle are seen here. I bet Indiana has it. <laughs> Possible treatments, although we have not done studies on this at UK. Um, Pacifate, imidacloprid, and bifenthrin. We would recommend treating in early spring. And again, we don't have any research on um, good methods to treat for this pest yet. And I see it everywhere, walking around Lexington. So, additional resources and questions on this pest? I have a question about the pest, but the actual national trials. Mm -hmm. so, that data and then the website of the 24 hours. I don't know if the major studies have come out on that yet. I believe it was a, how many years was it? Like a 20 year study, 10 year study. And this should be wrapping up, so I don't know if there's complete data on that yet. I bet you could Google National Elm Trial. <laughs> Anyone else? This pest was the least interesting, huh? <laughs> and I'm going to wrap it up with emerald ash borer. I'm sure you're all familiar with it, so I'll just give you some updates on what we're doing. Last year, 2011, there were 6,800 traps across the state in 96 counties. 2011, we had six new counties reporting the pest. These are the current quarantined counties for Kentucky. Concentrated in that Cincinnati, Louisville, Lexington triangle. This map is kind of hard to see. Um, the red dots indicate counties reporting emerald ash borer. And I noticed that over there on the wall, they have this map in real life. So it might be easier to read over there. This summer, we only had 1,600 traps. We moved the trapping line further south. As we find the, this beetle, we just move our trapping efforts further and further south. We're simply tracking the movement of this beetle. We're not trying to um, control it in any way with the traps. So what is being done? Biological control programs. We have three wasps that were found in this native range. The Spathius wasp there on the top was found to parasitize up to 90% of emerald ash borer larval in some ash trees in China. It's an ectoparasitoid, meaning it lays its egg on the outside of the emerald ash borer larva. Then the wasp larva will then consume the beetle larva from least vital to most vital organ, ensuring it stays alive as long as possible. The bottom left is a, a ubius agrilli, which attacks EAB eggs. An egg for an emerald ash borer is less than a millimeter long. So you can see how tiny this wasp is. This wasp, in conjunction with the wasp on the bottom right, was shown to have a 60% reduction of EAB in a Chinese forest.
Here's the spathius wasp walking on the bark. Um, we think that she finds her hosts through vibrations in her legs. As the emerald ash borer larva chews its way through the tree, she can feel that and stops so she knows where to drill into the wood with her ovipositor and lay her egg on the EAB larva. Can you see the spathius wasps in this picture? They're hard to find. This biological control program might be a long-term sustainable solution, although it's going to take a while to know if it's working. We don't have any data yet showing reduced numbers of emerald ash borer or if these wasps are establishing and overwintering in our area. We've released 35,000 wasps in 2011 down at Tom Sawyer Park in Louisville, Cedarmore in Shelby County, a private woodland north of Frankfurt, Shillitoke Park in Lexington, and a park in northern Kentucky in Boone County. And I have all of this com from, uh, contact information on the sheets that I handed out, and I have extras if you didn't get one. Um, a lot of those websites were where I found some of my information and pictures, and I found them to be helpful. So feel free to contact us if you have any more questions. And I'll take more now, too. Great question. Hmm? Uh, I noticed you didn't mention the video about the tree injection um, for the emerald ash board. Mm -hmm. Have y'all found with the tree injections that it's been affect affecting the population uh, with the flowers and the bees come, uh, come through? I, just I haven't. I haven't seen any data on that or heard that it's affecting the bee population. I. I just it's emitted a cloprid, yes. which is used for everything. So I'm not. I, I wouldn't pinpoint the EAB applications for the bee population. I was just curious. Yeah. I've, heard, I've heard somebody mention that it could be a possibility. Anyone else? I was going to say in the last mm -hmm. KNLA newsletter, there was a, a uh, article about uh, nicotinoids and insecticides yeah. and their effects on bees. So you might mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Anyone else? Okay, thank you. This video has been part of the University of Kentucky Nursery Crops web series. For more information on the topics discussed, please contact your county extension office.